The species our presentation will focus on is the Alaskan Chinook salmon and their management. Uh, there are five key concepts our presentation will cover that were emphasized in lecture, and we will address these as we continue through our presentation. So the first key concept covered is that seafood is an important part of food, culture, and economy. So the Alaskan Chinook salmon fishery is extremely common in the Northwest due to the state's cold Pacific waters. So this allows a lot of relatability to students here at UCSB and Californians in general, because the water in Alaska is very similar to those around us. Um, another reason why we chose this system is that salmon are very unique because they're and andromous, which means there are a lot of other problems that come up in their management. Andromus means that the organism spends most of its time in salt water, though it returns to fresh water to spawn. And then another very important reason is that Alaskan Chinook salmon are very important to the indigenous communities that reside there. So for thousands of years before European contact, indigenous peoples of the Pacific Northwest have anticipated the annual spring event, which is the return of the migration of the Chinook salmon into their freshwater systems. Alaskan native peoples embody the animal which they harvest and take in. Uh, therefore, the Alaskan indigenous tribes call themselves salmon people. And the salmon provides food security and a form of cultural connection for the tribes. It is also important to note that the Chinook salmon is an important keystone species for the Pacific Northwest. It's a vital food source for a diversity of wildlife, including orcas, bears, seals, and large birds of prey. Not only is the Chinook salmon a keystone species to the ecosystem, but also to the people there as well. So the salmon are a keystone of the coastal indigenous people's diets and their cultures. So you can see in this imagery here, a Chinook salmon, and then some Alaskan indigenous people uh, preparing the salmon in their traditional way, um, even having a ceremony here in the middle. And then on the far left are all of the species in which uh, the Chinook salmon is an important food source for. So for this part, I'll be focusing on ecological history. So the Chinook salmon are andromedous fish, meaning they live in both fresh and salt water. And along with that, there are numerous stocks of Chinook salmon, and they're also the largest of the Pacific salmon. They can grow as long as four feet and up to 130 pounds. These fish sexually mature between two and seven years old, but usually around three or four is when they return to spawn. And young and mature salmon feed on insects, amapods, and crustaceans. And so for the next part, I'll be focusing on the management history. So this salmon is managed by the NOAA Fisheries and the North Pacific Management Council. Uh, this basically means that it's managed under the fishery management plan for salmon fisheries in the coast of Alaska. And all management in federal waters is delegated to the state of Alaska, which also means that the state of Alaska is responsible for managing the commercial, recreational, and substance fisheries for salmon in state waters. Alaska also uses the Pacific Salmon Treaty and Pacific Salmon Commission to help coordinate management, research, and enhancement of shared US and international stocks. Along with that, Alaska also uses the Pacific Salmon Treaty. Um, this was basically formed by Canada and the US to implement the Pacific Salmon Treaty. And the Pacific Salmon Treaty was made to made due to salmon swimming across international borders and fishermen were catching um, salmon produced by other countries so they just thought it'd be easier to create a, cre create a treaty so everything worked out. And for the last part, uh, managers regulate the fishery based on escapement goals to ensure harvests are sustainable. Um, the fishermen, they just want to make sure enough salmon escape the fishery and return to fresh water to spawn and replenish the population. Salmon fisheries largely rely on in-season in assessment of how many salmon return to the fresh water spawn, and managers set harvest levels based on these returns. And luckily, there are no Chinook salmon listed as endangered in Alaska. 
And back to the key concepts, um, production and ecological carrying capacity is mostly focused around fisheries and aquaculture. All right, so um, there are many threats to the sa uh, Chinook salmon fishery in Alaska and in most of the other stocks. Overfishing is the largest threat to Chinook salmon populations. It is a very important recreational and commercial fishery. Um, and because this is such an important threat, there is a growing market for farmed Chinook salmon, which also relates to one of our other key concepts, which is that farming can break down wild trophic assumptions because um, Chinook salmon, when they are farmed, are generally fed different feeds from higher levels of the trophic, from higher trophic levels, or feed that they would just never have otherwise gotten. Um, and some of the other threats to the fishery are environmental stressors that can come in the form of dams, they can come in the form of water pollution, um, they can come in the form of warmer water, which is all due to climate change and anthropogenic factors. We're also seeing rain shifts, which is a threat more to the fishery than anything else, um, because Chinook salmon will move as the water warms and they will not observe borders or boundaries, which can really have serious impacts for both management and conservation, because it is harder to manage a fishery when it is constantly on the move. All right, so this is a focus on one of the other biggest threats to fisheries overall and to Chinook salmon in particular. Um, so climate change is at the root of a lot of the threats to Chinook salmon. First of all, um, as the climate warms, we get a loss of snowpack, which means that less snow, there will be less snow to melt and um, this results in a lower volume in the streams that salmon use to get to their breeding grounds and then to get back to the ocean. Warmer water also results in um, some increased vulnerability to disease, to parasites, um, and also makes them more susceptible to predators because um, warmer water means that the salmon will actually be smaller, which comes to another one of our key points, which is that life stages have trade-offs. So when a salmon individual needs to spend more of its energy to survive in this warmer, less than ideal environment, it's actually gonna not grow as much. And a smaller salmon is more vulnerable to the predators of the rivers and the ocean. Um, there are also increased levels of forest fires with climate change, which means that we will see increased pollution in the, in the rivers as um, fires lead to increased erosion. There's also, we're seeing sea level rise with warming waters and sea level rise is um, bad for salmon because it inundates low-lying estuaries, which are a critical ha uh, habitat for salmon when they make the transition from their ocean life stages to their river life stages. Um, ocean acidification is another problem that comes with global warming. And this one is largely problematic because ocean acidification um, will dissolve the shells of small mollusks, which are an important uh, food source for the juvenile salmon that live in the ocean. Um, lastly, severe weather is another one of the noted causes of climate change and or results of climate change. Um, and this means in storms and floods will wash away salmon eggs once they have attached to the um, higher river breeding grounds. Um, and severe fl floods can also wash toxic materials into the river so it, they can really decrease salmon reproductive success. Oh, sorry, one last thing. Um, there is another important um, key concept to be covered here in that growth can also be used to understand the condition and state of a population. 
So in with all of these dilemmas, understanding and monitoring the different stocks of salmon is really crucially important. And we are seeing that um, Chinook salmon populations are shrinking in warmer waters. So that's how we know, okay, climate change in warmer waters is having a pretty serious effect on the success of the populations and smaller fish are either doing better or they're just the ones that are surviving because they're budgeting their energy in that way. Um, so growth is a really important thing to pay attention to, particularly when you are looking through a lens of threats or environmental impacts on fishery species. And finally, we will address the possible solutions to the declining Chinook salmon fisheries in Alaska. So most of the problems resulting in the declining status of the fish are due to environmental issues, mainly climate change. So because of this, it's very difficult for there to be a quick fix and it's going to, re going to rely on lots of small changes and mainly uh, problems, any solutions that would contribute to the fixing of climate change and reversing of the warming of our planet would in turn help the Chinook salmon fisheries. So it is unclear if the environmental mechanisms selecting for these smaller, younger Chinook salmon are likely to change in the near future. Although something that has contributed to their change is an abnormally warmer PDO. And uh, PDO is the Pacific Decadal Oscillation Index. So this is a robust reoccurring pattern of ocean atmosphere climate variability, and it is centered over the mid latitude Pacific basin. So you can see in the uh, bottom right hand image in uh, graphic of the PDO. So the population growth at low abundances and a corresponding shift in the PDO to colder conditions in Alaska could possibly reverse the trends in declining Chinook salmon size um, and their age at return. But even more so, it could also have an impact on their population abundance. So in recent years, there have been cold PDO patterns, but the returning spawn of the fish born in these conditions have only recently begun to return. So because of this, uh, it's unclear as to exactly what the pattern is with a colder PDO, and it might take several generations for a change to become apparent. And because of only a few strong PDO shifts, we have a very weak understanding of their contribution to Chinook salmon size, and it's highly subject to event by event variability and surprises. And of course, uh, some possible solutions go with conservation efforts. Um, some of these include captive rearing and hatcheries, removal and modification of dams and culverts, restoration of degraded habitat and improvements to water quality and in-stream flow. All right, so last of all, we have some additional questions. Um, some of the ones that we came up with were really just about the future implications of climate change. Will Chinook salmon as a fishery be able to sustain itself? Um, will aquaculture take over as the most feasible way to keep consuming Chinook salmon? Um, and then we also got some interesting research questions from the Alaska Fish and Game um, Research Initiative. And each of these are current directions that they are going looking into to ensure that we are well informed about the future of the Chinook salmon stock in Alaska. Here are our citations. And thank you. 